welcome to go on the run and today we're going to start section 23 so in 23 we're going to be looking at grpc so what is grpc grpc stands for grpc remote procedure call yes it's a recursive acronym um, if you know about php is php is a hypertext processor or perl perl regular expression expression language or something like that but those are examples of recursive um, acronyms gnu gnu is not unix right so anyway grpc is the same thing okay so before we get into remote procedure calls which builds on protocol buffers which we just finished in section 22 we gonna look in part one here at context and that is the context passage package in golang and the reason why we want to spend some time understand the punk context package before we get into grpc it's best to just cover that before we get into grpc and then have to come back and potentially cover it context package some of the reason you might want to use um, the context package is that it simplifies the implementation for cancellation and doing things like deadline across api boundaries now, what are API boundaries? Like somebody might give you a package that has some fun um, some function or something that you call, that's an API, you do not implement it. And so that's going across an API boundary. So I could generalize this to say, it simplifies the implementation for cancellation and deadline across processes and API boundaries. But here I just put API boundaries, but sort of think also process boundaries also, because in our example, where we had a client and server, well, that's different processes and you can use the context package to signal things like cancellation and like you waited too long. For example, if you're the client and you make a request to the server, you might say, you know, I just want this request to take one second. If it cannot be completed in that time, automatically cancel it or, you know, close the connection or something like that. Um, it prepares your code. This is another reason for using it, in my opinion. It prepares your code. If you get in the habit of writing code that you think that might potentially be called by someone else, or you're going to expose as an API in any form, whether it's a, as a package or as a separate process, you want to start thinking about using context um, in your API because it prepares your code for scale. Uh, what I mean by that is as you write more and more complex application, it is going to get to the point where you're going to want to express things like, how long does it take for me to accomplish a task? call another um, API, how do I cancel it efficiently, how do I express those things? And so using the getting in the habit of using the context package now or early on makes this sort of thing easier. And the final thing, fairly easy to use. I will see the context package exposes about four functions that you really um, can use. Most of the time you're probably going to use like three of them, but again, not very difficult to use. So let's go to the not grpc website because we're not going to be looking at that now but rather the context package documentation and here we see that it says package context defines the context type which carries deadline cancellation signals and other request scoped variables across api boundaries and between processes so if you remember i mentioned that that all in the case of like our client and server application that we've been working with, those are two different processes. They can be in different machines even, right? And you can use the context package to carry cancellation and signaling information across process boundary or API boundaries. That, let's say, for example, it might be in the same process, but you're calling different API, which is what we're going to look at today. We're going to do more API boundaries than across process boundaries. Incoming requests to a server should create a context and outgoing calls to a server should accept a context. The chain of function call between them must propagate the context. All this means is that essentially, if you have an API that you expose at, um, as a server, let's say your server, and you expose an API, and there you should accept a context and any incoming request should create a context all right so now your server accepts a context in the request incoming request accept a context because the server is going to present that incoming request right um make it available to accept requests so what it means is once the server get the context it should propagate that context 
down through the calls and sub calls. So let's say your server is doing a call, like for example, login or authenticate user. That might involve calling out to some other um, API that you know looks up in a database or MongoDB or whatever. And if that function and you write in that function, ideally you should pass that context on to that function. The reason why? Because if the incoming context that you receive was to be canceled, you want to be able to propagate that cancellation or whatever time information come in with it, timeout information comes in with that context, down to the other APIs that you call so that they can also respect that cancellation or whatever signal is sent across. So these are the four other functions that I mentioned that you can use with context. Basically, you can say create a context with cancellation, which allows you to basically say, wait, you want to cancel that context? With deadline and timeout are essentially the same thing with a slight difference, and I'll show you the difference between them. But essentially says create a context that expired after a certain on a specific time or this expired after a certain duration of time. And then with value, it just allows you to create a context that adds value, key value pairs to it, and you can propagate that and pass that on. So for example, if server interface for that authenticate user, you might attach to that context the user ID or something like that, pass that down to some other con um, functions or API that needs to help you resolve that information, that authentication, and that API can then look up what was that user ID that came in with that request. And so um, that's one way to create a value context. Now it says here, when a context is canceled, all contexts derived from it are also canceled. We'll look at this in a minute. And again, this is the reason for propagating that context. If you imagine that a context come in at the API, um, at the server, that's the first place that it enters this process. If you did not propagate that context or a derived co context derived from that context, then those other sub API call will not be able to respect that the context was canceled, for example. Now, I encourage you to read the documentation if you're going to use context. Um, so it explains that how each context is created from a parent context and therefore it results in a derived context, which is the child context and so on. And of these three, the with cancel, with deadline, and with timeout, they return a cancel function that you can be used to cancel, to trigger canceling the context. The value context doesn't have such a thing because it sort of doesn't make sense if you create a value context, all you have is key value pairs in there. So there's nothing to really cancel. It's just a way of passing information across API and process boundary. And then it says, failing to call the cancel function leaks the child and its children until the parents is canceled or the timer fires. And all that is saying is that for these other three um, contexts that you can get as derived from these calling these function, that you should just arrange to call the cancel function anyway. And we'll see how to do that. And that's just like sort of like if you open a file or you just arrange to close the file um, so you don't leak any resources. All right. So... You should, can go through and read the rest of this, but program that uses context should follow these rules to keep interfaces consistent across packages and enable static analysis tool to check context propagation. And so it says, do not store context inside of struct type. Instead, pass a context explicitly. So basically, you want to make sure that that's um, the first parameter to a function like this. And this should be the first parameter, typically named context. And you're going to see this everywhere where anyone uses Golang context. They just use this CTX name, and it is the first um, parameter to the function. And so it's always going to be something like this. Uh, it says do not pass a nil context. So that means that, oh, remember I said prepare your code for scale. So you're thinking, okay, I'll go ahead, I'll write some API functions, and I'll use this context parameter. But since right now I'm not really using any cancellation or anything like that, I don't need to pass any value, what should I pass when I call my functions? Do not call nil context. Just simply um, pass the context that to do or the value that's returned by context that to do. It just simply means and it makes it clear that oh, this is something you plan to address in the future, but right now you don't have any uses for it. It says the same context may be passed to functions running in different um, Go routines. So contexts are a go routine safe. So no need to worry about having multiple copies of it and all this other thing or any silly race conditions. And we'll use this to our advantage um, in our example. 
Okay, so this is the documentation. And like I said, it's a very simple package to use. And essentially, those are your three functions that return a cancel function. We'll look at them again. Don't worry, we'll come back. And this is the one to create a context that's derived from a value. And then this is your do to do context. We have your background context. Again, not a whole lot. And then there's some examples, but we'll ignore that for now. And we'll simply jump back to our presentation so we can understand a little bit more about this idea of a parent context and a child context. When you read uh, that a context is created by having a parent context and then a child context that's derived from that parent, then you would be thinking of something like a tree, right? Where there's something at the top and then there are children. And that's exactly how contexts are created. You always have a parent context and then you can create one or more child contexts from that parent. Now, you can also um, create more context based off of that child. So if, for example, here we have child 1.1 and child 1.2 that was created from the context child 1. Well, that's because those two new contexts use child one at its parents. And each one of these can be different types of context. So I can have, let's say, a initial parent context that a background context. And then from that, I can create a value context. And then over here, I could create a cancellation context. Then from this value context, I could derive from that a um, timeout context or a deadline context. And all it means is that these contexts on the um, at any point have all the same values going back up to the parents. Now, anywhere in my function call, let's imagine these were function call, I could also start off and create a absolutely new context tree. So that is also possible. But ideally, you don't want to do that. Ideally, what you really want to do is link all the context together. That way, if, for example, this parent is, con is canceled, it would trigger down to all the subchildren. And at any level, you can do a cancellation. So for example, I might trigger cancellation at this level to trigger to cancel this child, which would cancel all of its children, but that still leave this child running, for example. And we'll see exactly what we mean by that. So we said that though, we can create um, context by deriving from a parent context. So how might we actually use this in an application? Let's say I have an application and it needs to make a call to um, API 1 and API 2. And it doesn't really matter if I'm going to cross process boundary or not, right? But I just put it this way. Well, one of the things I can do then is I can create a background context and just accept this. We don't know what it is, but it's just a context that's of type basically create from the background function and basically said, I intend to use context from this point on. And so now from this background context, I might create a timeout context for one second and say that oh, that should be passed to API 1, which simply means that I'm going to give API 1 one second to do its work. I can then pass to API 2 a timeout context, a different context derived from the background context, you know, timeout 2, which means I give API 2 two seconds to complete its work. But notice both contexts, time for um, API 1 and API 2 were derived or are children of my background context. Of course, we expect with this timeout of one, after one second, this would cancel by itself and therefore trigger the cancellation of anything else below it. So let's say my API 1 needs some help to accomplish its work and it needs to call like API 3 and API 4. So API 1 might create from the timeout context that it got, create a deadline context derived from this context to pass to API 3, basically saying, API 3, I'm giving you half a second to get your work done. And then API 4, I'm not giving you a specific time, but rather I'm passing you some secret value as a value context. So hopefully this sort of gives you a slightly better idea of what you mean by parents and child context, or you know when a child is derived from a parent and how that might be used as you call different APIs. Okay, let's jump into some code. So here I am in my Goro on the run directory. Now we're going to jump into gRPC. So let's go to um, directory 23. And we have a few parts, but of course, we'll start with part one. So let's go to part one, well, part one. And I'll start up my Visual Studio Code editor here. And this directory for the moment is empty which is totally fine. We can create everything we want. 
Um, let me close this. I don't need this. All right. So let me zoom in a little bit so you can see that. And so the first thing I'm going to start with is by creating an exercise directory, exercise one. Now, there are a number of examples that I'll be going through. And this is why I want to remind you, no matter how fast I type, you don't need to see me type errors. What you really want to see is the code that I develop and if I can explain what it's doing. Now, the reason for showing you as I write the code is so you see how the code evolves. That's why I do these examples, copy the file, start with a previous example, and then sort of evolve it. But you don't want to see me do that real time because while some people like seeing that, it's going to make the video extremely long and that is not going to work for other people. So I try to take a middle ground by leaving the code edits in there, but speeding it up. If you want to see how I develop it, just slow it down. If you don't care for that, just speed it up. If the speed is good enough for you, but you still want to see the end result, just fast forward or literally go to the link below and you can see the code that I am about to write. If you pause this video right now, go to the link in the code description and go to GitHub. You can navigate and find this code. I have to remind people of this because people get sort of antsy and nervous when they see that the code is sped up. All right. So <laughs> uh, it's sort of a weird thing when you're watching the video and you see the code speed up and you forget that, oh, you know what? I can just pause the video and go see what the end result is. So uh, let's do a few things. I'm going to create a module in my example directory. And then I want to write a um, simple um, application, Go application, that kick off a number of Go routine. Each go routine is going to do a little bit of work for a few milliseconds. But of course, the correct way to implement this, I have to wait for all the go routines to complete their work or the slowest one to complete the work before I can say that my application is completed. So that is the code I'm going to write. And so I might pause and talk about it a little bit in between, but I certainly will review it and explain it at the end. So let's go. Okay, so what do I have so far? So we want to wait for, um, we want to kick off a few go routines. So this is our worker here. And a worker go routine just takes an ID. It prints out what its ID is. It calculates a random duration of time. And so it uses rand and it uses this new random number generator that we created. Um, and we created using new source. And that's because we want to initialize it with the current Unix time. And that gives us a better way of getting some random number. And then we can get a random number when this worker is called. That's our duration. So we get a random number between zero and 5,000 or rather 4,999 essentially. And then we turn that into a duration. We have to cast that to the duration type that we get from the times package. And then we say, how long is that duration? Is it in seconds or milliseconds? So essentially we're doing between zero and up to five seconds really. But because we're doing milliseconds, now we can be a fraction of a second and so on, right? So maybe 2.5 seconds or 2.9 seconds, that sort of thing. All right, so we have that. And then once we have our duration, this is how long we're going to sleep. This represents the work that our worker function is going to do. It's going to tell us that it's starting, then it's going to sleep, and then it's going to print when it's finished that work. Now, if we were to just say, for example, let's just say we have a constant represent representing how many workers we want. So if we did something like that and we were to run this right now, what it would do is it will create the, the workers. The problem is that we most likely wouldn't see anything because in our main, as soon as we finish creating those worker or main exit, and if you remember how go routine work, once main exit, everything else attached to main or main created will also exit. So go routine wouldn't have the opportunity to run. And we can do that by doing Go build, make sure we don't have any error, and we have an executable. And if we run it, you'll see that oh, nothing happens. So what we really need is to be able to wait until these go routines complete. And so to do that, we can create something called a wait group. So we can have a variable, and we can call it wait group is equals to sync that wait group. And we can create it's a struct value. And uh, empty or initial value of a the zero value for the struct value is a valid weight group. So we have that. And if we save, we should automatically see that the package is included. Now you might have seen that I exit my Go routine and started back or my Visual Studio Code editor earlier and started back. And that's because sometimes um, I find that Visual Studio Code doesn't quite, or rather not Visual Studio Code, but the Glow plugin doesn't work well and keep up with my changes. And I find that when I close it and come back in, then it sort of um, understand what's going on. 
in before though i actually add some bugs in my code where i had the parentheses in the wrong place and so on so okay i'm writing this code live so this is exactly why i'm going to speed it up okay so now that we have that we need to we can say after this point we can say sync uh, wait group that wait and so that tells us to wait for all our go routine to complete but how do we know when all our go complete routines are complete well, our grow routine themselves have to say when they're done. So wait group that done. So they each gonna call wait group that done. But we need to initialize or do something every time we create a go routine. So we know keep accurate count of how many go routines we have. We have to say wait group that add. And we create in one go routine each time we go through this loop. So we should do wait group that add. And when this is finished, even, even if the go routines haven't run yet because it's going to wait until this number, whatever, when we do an add, it increments some value within this weight group, it's gonna wait until that value is zero. And we can imagine that the weight group that done is decrementing the value. So until those go routines get to run and complete the work, well, we'll just be blocked right here waiting for all of them to complete. And so if we do go build, and then now we run our code again, as you can see, um, go routine one and two started. Now they're completing and great. Now maybe we should print out how long these guys are going to run. So go routine um, worker that started for percentage V. All right. So maybe we move this duration up above here, for example, something like that. I'm not no, sure. Oh, yeah. So we need a second parameter here and that's D. And so if we do go build and then we rerun this, we should see, um, good, great. So now we see how long they're gonna wait and then how long they actually waited, which makes sense that our go routine one should finish first and it does followed by go routine zero. Okay, so this seems to be working correctly now. We can wait for a go routine. Let's say for example, our requirement is we're gonna kick off some go routine to do some work and we have that already but we don't wanna wait for any go routine that's gonna take longer than one second. So after a second, stop doing the work you're doing, clean up, and that's fine. I, I figured out another way or somebody else was faster than you. So we wanna do cancellation after one second. So let's see how we do that. So for that, let's copy this code example, and then let's paste it as example two. And since we don't know anything about context right now, we're gonna do go um, routine cancellation the only way we can think of, and that is with um, channels. So to do a cancellation with channels, what we're gonna do is create a channel, and it's gonna be a channel with the number of workers we have. And the reason why we want that is because we wanna send each go routine, if we have to cancel, we don't know how many of them would have completed the work in the one second or not. So we have to be able to send each go routine or put a value on that channel for each go routine to read. So. For example, let's just say that so before we start creating go routine, we'll create a channel to send the cancellation work or a message to tell them to cancel. And so our workers must take a channel. So, all right, so let's see what we're doing. So when we create, we create a channel for, and the length of that channel is the number of workers that we intend to create. And then each time we create a worker, we give it a reference to that channel. Okay, great. What does the worker do with that information now? The worker use select. What is select? Well, select is this really cool way of you basically being able to listen on multiple channels and basically taking an action when one of those channels um, is ready to send or receive. If you haven't used select, check out my Golang videos on how to use select. And so essentially what we're saying is select, I want you to wait until this timer expires. So notice we're not using time that sleep anymore. We use time that after. Why? Because time that after said, give me a duration and I'll send you a message on a channel. I'll return to your channel and then I'll send you a message when that time has elapsed. And so by waiting here on that channel, we're saying wait for this time to elapse. It did, if this time elapsed that we need to do work, just remember this represents how much work, D represents how much work we're doing in this go routine, how long it take us to do some work. If this time elapsed before we get a message on CH, then it's all good and select is only gonna take one path and it takes the one that is ready. If there are multiple ready, then it takes 
it just selects from one of them, right? Uniform distribution. And assuming this finishes first before we get a cancel message, then we'll just exit the select statement because we've executed the one case that we have. And now we can say, oh, we have done our work. And then we can say to the work group that, oh, I'm done. And so this go routine is considered complete and we exit. Now, what happens if we get a message on the CH channel? So if we get a message here, we should say that oh, we're done and return. Now, a better way of doing this actually would be to say something like this. We should do like a default first thing, default column with group that done. So that way we don't have to think about where we call it. And we should just simply say this return and we don't have to worry about it here because if when we return here, it was called the with group that done. And similar here, when we return at the end there, it will call with group that done. So you guys are all we exit this function, whether it's because we completed our work and then jump got to here, with group that done will be called. Or if we get canceled, with we'll return here. Now, what is interesting about this is that we'll be able to see that we'll start in some work in this worker. But if we never see this completed, that means that oh, we were canceled. Now, how do we do the cancellation? Here, we're not doing any cancellation. Here, we're literally just waiting for our um, routines to complete. This is no different than what we had before. So, and we can, you know, build it and run it and see it how nothing has changed. So if we go up to exercise two, we can do go build. Shouldn't have any errors. And if we run it, it's going to be just as before, where you can see some of these workers are taking four point something seconds and we've waited for them waited for them to complete now we want to force them to complete after one second so we simply delay after we've created them delay for a second time that after and we want to delay for one second time that second okay so this means that by waiting here we're going to be blocked at this line until a second has elapsed but we're going to say oh we just kicked them off let's wait a sec give them a second to do some work this means give them a second to get started and start running and everything, but either way, we, we don't care. We're giving them a second. This is the best we can do right now. And then after this point, we're going to start sending those cancel messages, right? So we can do for i equals to zero, for example, i less than the number of workers, i plus plus. Okay, so what have we done? We've waited for a second, and then after we've created our go routine, we've waited for a second, and then after a second, we start sending on that channel messages to our go routine. Now we could have used false or true, it doesn't matter because our workers don't actually care about the value that they read from that channel. All they care about is that I read something, which means that oh, this is my cancellation channel, and this means I should cancel, that's all. And so let's review. So this is the only part that change. We created a channel and the channel is the number of workers that we plan to create. We create our workers, giving them a reference to the channel that we create. And then after we create our workers, we spawn them off as go routine. We waited a second and then we start sending messages to those on the channel saying that all those workers should cancel if they haven't finished their work yet. Now remember, the only workers that's gonna get this cancel message is the ones that are still blocked here at the select. Because if, for example, the duration was calculated to be half a second, they would get a message back from time that duration first. They would print out that how they complete their work and they would have returned. So it doesn't really matter. And so even if our channels still have values that haven't been read when we finish, well, so long as our, all our go routines re, um, have returned, you know, cleaned up properly, we can just exit our main program and that's okay. The channel will be cleaned up. We won't have any memory leak at that point. So let's do go build. And what we want to see is that our program runs for no longer than a second. And so that's exactly what we see. This go routine, worker zero, says it's gonna take 393 milliseconds, and we can see that that guy completed. These other ones that are gonna do more than one second, they didn't get to run. And so none of our go routine run that time or this time. And you could keep running this thing, you're gonna see anything that running more than a second doesn't get to run. 
only the one that come in on that second. So we're doing cancellation using channels. And we can see that our program is taking about a second to run because we can do it this way. We can time it this way. And as you can see, it's about a second is how long it takes to run. And only those go routine that come in on that second. And you'd have to run a few to see if you can get multiple go routines to, because the value is random. If we had set smaller um, values, they would come in on the the um, the one second. But you know, we got it random up to five. All right. So this is as simple as this program is. I really like playing with it. I just keep running it over and over just to see the different ways in which. Um, you know, oh, we have random duration and which go routine gets to complete um, within the time frame that we specify and us getting to cancel them. So anyway, so hopefully you're convinced that that's working. So now let's see, now that we've seen how to cancel go routine using, um, you know, channels, let's see if we can make this work with context and what the difference would be. The key, remember, to how we're using a channel the channel length is the same length as the number of go routine because we have to send that many number of signals to basically say cancel just in case as worst case we need to cancel all of our go routine now context takes care of some of that headache for us and we'll see that now so let's copy this and again i will probably go a little bit fast but look at the end result don't worry about how i type fast i type and so we'll call this exercise three and this example we're doing we're going to do go routine cancellation using context not channel and that's going to be the context package and so if you remember i said what you want to do is be able to create a context that you'll pass to your children so let's create that context here and we're going to call that variable ctx and we're going to say context package that background context for example and all that means is just create a context that we know that's going to run you know, do something in the background. It doesn't, it's not very fancy. And as you can see, when you over over background context, or rather if I do command um, click, uh, let's see, try and get the documentation here. Um, it's not loading. I'm not sure why it's not loading. But uh, if we go back to the documentation and we scroll along and we click on background context, it says background returns in non nil empty context. It is never canceled, has no value, and has no deadline. It is typically used as the main function, initialization, and test, and as the top level context for incoming requests. So this is the context you want to use. You want to use a backend context to represent that very high level parent request. The to-do context, on the other hand, returns a non-nil empty context. Code should use context to do when it's unclear which context to use. Or if it's in, um, if or if it is not yet available because the surrounding function has not been extended to accept a context, right? So that's the only time you want to do to do. We don't want to use to do. We want to use background. And so we have this background context, and now we're going to pass that to our workers. And so there we go. And we should say that out. This is ctx from which package context, and the value is context context. Okay, so there we go. How do we use a context? Well, here we were waiting for a value to be timed out. And here, instead of a channel, what we have is this context, and we can do context that done. And essentially, if we go look at the documentation for this, it says, um, let's see, documentation, done returns a channel, and that's exact, that's good because it's returning a channel that is closed when work is done on behalf of this context. So we don't really care how this context gets canceled or how done is signal. All we know it returns a channel and we can read that channel and to say that, oh, this means that our work is done and these go routines should therefore clean up and return. That's the only change we made was change this to say context and change this to say context that done. That's it. So after a minute, we want to signal that we have completed work. Now, the difference here is we don't have to loop over to send multiple values. We just have to cancel the signal in that one context that our work is done. So 
The way we can do this is the background context. If you remember from the documentation just now, it says background return a non nil context. It is never cancel and have no value. So we cannot really use background then to signal that or we should cancel any work. What we really need is one of these functions like cancel. So cancel tells an operation to cancel work. But how do we get that? We call the with cancel function. With cancel takes a parent context, returns a new child context or that derived can context. And it also returns a reference to a function that we can use to signal that we want work to be canceled. So if we go back to our code, uh, let's close all these and then just open this alone. If we go back to our code, then what we really want to do is call the background here our parent context, create a new context called ctx. That is, and we also know we can have a cancel function and we will call context that with cancel, give it our parent and that's it. We don't have to pass any more parameters. And so we pass this CTX now to our workers. This is a context that can, that can be canceled. And how do we cancel it? Well, after waiting one second, we can just say cancel. Remember, it's a function. So this is how we signal this cancel function is tied to, is coupled to this context. So by calling this, it tells this context to cancel. And that's all there is to it. And let me review the code again just to show you what we did. We create a background context. We create a derived context from it with cancellation. We have a cancel function. We have the new derived context. We pass the derived context to our workers. We wait for a second, just like we were doing before, and then we call the cancel function. We don't have to loop over or worry about the number of workers or any such weird thing because contexts are safe to pass the multiple go routines and each one of them would see the same thing. In our go our worker, the go routine here, it's getting that context and all it does is it wait to get a signal on the done channel. So it does that by calling done method, which returns a channel on which it can read when work is done on behalf of this context that it's using. So just as before, if it happens to finish before, everything is great. If it gets a cancellation on that context, well, then it just return. And so if we go back up and we CD to our uh, wrong place, save. If we go here to our command line, CD up to our example three, and we go to go build, and then we run this. Okay, let's time it again. We should see that our, our function, our application still take one second to complete, but notice what happened. None of them got to do any work because we were able to cancel them. Now we could put a message in here saying that our canceling, um, you know, work or something like that. That's just going to pollute our output with most messages. But we, we know that's what happened because that's once these workers started, there's only two ways out of it. Either they finished their work here and got to this place or the this case was executed in which case they return before they can execute this line and the fact that we don't see that line means that oh um, they never finished their work and so here we can see one of them he was going to run for 435 milliseconds and he got to complete his work because by the time we send done well he was already returned so it didn't matter he's no longer blocked at this select statement waiting all right so again, we could run this a few times. Ah, I changed my code, but we could run this a few times and see that how it works exactly as before. None of them should run that time. Yep, we have two of them that, that run this time. One that completed, two. And so, yes, you can have fun running these over and over. But hopefully the key takeaway here is that we've introduced context into how we're doing cancellation. And it was just much cleaner in my opinion, than messing around with for loop and how many values you have to send on a channel to a worker. Now, okay, so we've seen that how we can make things simpler, but we can make it even simpler still using context. For example, remember we said that how um, context have this idea with deadline or with timeout. In this case, we know that how we only want to wait for a one second. So why don't we create a context 
with a deadline of one second from when we start doing work or we could create a context with a timeout of one second which basically say i'm giving you one second to do this work so um let's create the context with a um a timeout of one second which would be similar to this and so let's create example four okay and the way we do that is here we created with cancel but remember we want to change from doing that so we'll say with timeout instead and with timeout takes a parent context so we can certainly do that we have parent context and the duration which is how long this function should um the timeout that we want to give this context and notice it return a um context and also cancellation function which we saw in the documentation set at all with timeout with um cancel with background with um deadline they all return a cancellation function that we should call so we still expect that so let's put our timeout value t here and what we'll do is we'll take this and move it up to the top here so we'll say that how we have time that duration of one second t is equals to time that duration so that would be that and so if we look at this this is time that duration which is what we're passing here is our timeout value and we also learned at all when you have a cancellation function you should call it anyway and so it doesn't matter that um, this context will be canceled automatically after one second because that's our timeout that we're given since it returns a cancellation function not to leak resources or having to wait until the parent context go away we should just call cancel so we will uh, do that by arranging for cancel to be called after all the go routines are completed before we're using cancel to signal the go routines to finish and we could still do that but since this is a timeout context based on one second well that's going to take care of our one second for us and so this cancel is basically for clean up on good programming practice so if we go to example four example four and go bill and we rerun it so time we should still see that our application run in one second and still we don't allow any go routine that takes more than a second to run and you can see that here we only run the two go routine that were able to complete before the timeout was canceled okay let's keep going so in our next example we're going to see that while we're still using this um sync weight group we don't actually need that because before we're using sync that weight group to make sure that all we know when our go routine complete because we don't want to exit our main prematurely and our go routine then probably have a time to exit and complete but now that we use in context and we tell them when to cancel we don't actually need to do that so we can change this from doing a sync that weight group to simply getting rid of this um sync that weight group um, variable and we'll see how to do that so let's copy this and call this example five we do not need a weight group, so let's delete this weight group. We don't need that, and therefore we do not need to call this. Let's remove that. We do not need to say we're waiting here. Um, that's fine. And we do not need to say that we're done on that weight group, okay? Because these workers are gonna come in, do their thing after they finish, exit, wait here for a signal to say that they're done and thing. Now we still have the problem in main now that we, we don't have a weight group so let's save this we have the problem in main that will come in create some go routine this is a default this calls when we're leaving so which means that though if we were to run this code right now when we're about to exit this main we'll send cancel to all our go routine and there's a good chance that they wouldn't even start running so let's go to um, five and we'll see that though if we go go build and then we do time that this, you'll see it all. We wouldn't even get any of our go routine to even start running. So we still need a way to wait. So remember though, that on this context, after it times out, it sends a message um, on this done channel, which is what our go routines are using. So in main, we can do the same thing. We can say, wait for this context to be canceled. 
we can do the same exact thing that we're doing inside of our go routine because a timeout is going to be a message is going to be sent to cancel this context after one second anyway so why not do the same thing and so if we go build this now and then we rerun we'll see that oh, the same effect our application finishes after one second we allow those um, workers who can finish within one second or less than a second to complete and there we go and we can see that our application is still working as before here we had two go routines that came in on the uh, um, thing we had none there we have one there uh, none this time um, but you get the gist that it's working exactly the same as before okay um, this is pretty sweet it's simplified our code significantly well not significantly but oh, uh, exaggeration there but it simplified our code we had one less package to use that is the change okay the next example let's do nested cancellation so this would be the example where we call some API to do some work and like this API has to call something else to do some work and we want that once it's canceled in the parent that all oh, those nested one also get the cancellation that they should also finish their work. I'll copy five, I'll paste it here as six, exercise six, and I'll close everything else and make sure that I just edit exercise six that way. And this time we want to do go routine, nested go routine cancellation. So nested uh, go routine cancellation. And so the easiest way to do this, I think, is to simply copy our worker function and let's call this guy subworker. Very creative. So we call this subworker. And so subworker does some work, the same exact same thing. Um, this time, however, I want to know what my subworkers are because I want them to have an ID derived from their parent. So I'll change this from an intuit string like that. And then up here, it means that in main, when I'm creating these subworkers, well, I have to turn this int into a string. So I can simply do um, from a string package, um, you know, ASCII to int or something like that. But I'll be lazy and just instead of using another package, I'll just use a string format and this guy, and then just say percent V and then um, call this I. So that way I don't have to use yet another package. So let's review what I've done. I have a parent context that has a timeout of one second. That's going to govern the time my entire application is going to work, run because that's the context I'm giving to all my Go routine. One second to get their work done. Once that timer goes off, then I exit my main. My Go routines themselves, they can choose any time, of course, a random value, in which they can get some work done. If they can get their work done in that time, Great, they print out work completed. If they can't and they get a cancellation from the context I give them, then they simply return. But what they're going to do is they're lazy and they're going to ask for some help by creating a new context with a deadline, which is from the time that they start running and they're going to give their workers, their own sub-workers, um, 500 milliseconds um, from the time that they were invoked. And so they create that new context, they pass it to their sub worker. And then if they have to leave for whatever reason, either because they finished their work and their sub worker didn't finish or because they were canceled, they will cancel the context of their sub worker. And so the sub workers, they just get a context and they also get some work to do. Okay. So this is going to be a little much to review. So let's um, clear our screen. Let's go to example six. Let's go make, go build, now build, make. And then let's do time that, and let's run this. Okay, so let's like, see what's happening. Our application is still running in one second. It must, because in main, we end main after we get a done message on the context, which is a timeout of one second. So that didn't change. Let's see what our model workers. So we click off three workers. No big deal. One of them said that I'm going to finish some work in 700 milliseconds. So great. We should expect that, that this worker should say that oh, it's completed. And it does. The other two, we know that oh, they're not going to be able to finish their work. So they're going to be canceled. But each worker 
also spins off a subworker. So this guy spins off a subworker, and his subworker says, "You know what? I'm going to get work done in one second." Well, that doesn't matter because our entire application caps it at one second. So when this is cancel is sent, it's going to send down the chain. As a matter of fact, and so even if that go routine is still out there, even after its parents return trying to do work, guess what? It doesn't matter. It's going to get canceled. And so we should not see that sub worker two completed. And we don't. The only thing that ever got completed is this guy. And similarly, blah, blah, blah. And so we can see that all these other guys, um, these sub workers who were doing work for more than one second, they didn't get to print out anything. And if we run this, we should see. Um, blah. Let's see if we see anything interesting. And so we have one sub worker started here. Uh, not a sub worker, all these guys. The only thing that got finished are the workers themselves. None of these sub workers got any work done. And uh, we could run it and see if we can get a sub worker to get a, because this is a random time. So hopefully we can get a sub worker that actually um, can finish some work. We need a sub worker to say, oh, I'm going to get work done in half of a second before we can see it actually complete. So we'll have to keep running this. <laughs> it doesn't know. We don't know, but it should be possible to see that a sub worker um, is going to be finished in half a second. If so long as we get we got a sub worker with, oh, there we go. There is a sub worker who completed in 495 milliseconds, right? Because it says sub worker 0 0.1 started, and because it it was only given half a second to do its work, so it got its work done. All right, I said I told you this was going to be a little hard to to grasp, but this is nested. Um, this is an example of how you can do nested cancellation where the overall application is given these workers one second, but then the workers themselves are given their sub workers half a second. And only if this sub worker can finish within half a second from the time they started, then um, thing. Now, what's the difference between um, timeout and deadline? And if you look, you'll see it all, they pretty much use the exact same way. When we created this deadline, we get a context back and a cancellation function. The difference is in the parameter. Here we use a time and time represent like calendar time. So it's now plus some additional time, how long. So you can think of this as our duration. We really want this thing to run for half, these sub workers to run for half a second. And so it's from now plus half a second. But when we create a timeout above here, it is actually behind the scene using a deadline. It does the same thing. It takes our duration, calls time that now, add our duration to it, and then return the value and then call with deadline. And to see that, if you go to the source code and you look here and you read it, you'll see that timeout returns with deadline, parents time that now plus the timeout you pass it. So you can use either one. All right, so that's the difference between them. In our last example, we're going to look at an example of using um, a value context. So let's copy this. I'm going to enter like example seven. I'm going to close this to make sure we're not editing the wrong code. And then here we go. So for now, let me pull this down this way. So let's do nested go routine um, using with value okay so i still want my parent here to my main context to cancel after one second i don't want my application to run more than one second that doesn't that's fine but here i want to pass to my um my first go routine i want to pass it uh let's say a value so how do i do it well, if when you use in the value context, like it, um, it said in the documentation, you want to use your own type so that as not to cause any problem with any other packages that might be using a context and a string or something. So you don't want to use any built in type. So you should create your own type. And the way to think of a value content is a key value pair. You put in a key and a value. And what you're doing is you're passing the context down with that key value stored in it. And the uh, receiving function or API then looks up that key to get the value. So let's create our own key type as a new type. So our new type is called top secret key and it's of type string, right? 
And so now let's create, let's create a key and value. And so this is our key and value. So let's create a, um, let's create a context that's derived from our timeout context where we put that value in. Remember, you can just derive context from any one can be a parent. So we could create a value context first and then use that as our context, um, our top level context. So for example, and so what we have is a background context derived from that is a value context derived from our value context is this timeout context. And then we pass our timeout context into our worker function. And within our worker here, we can try looking up that key. So the key we're looking for is what? Top secret with the value going out. That is the key we want. We have to know what we're looking for. And we look up this key. If it's in there, we'll get a non-nil value. Now we can check for a non-nil value, but all I'm gonna do is print out here that starting work for so-and-so seconds with um, value, you know, let's call it value one, for example, V1, um, you know, a little value with value percent V, and then we put that value that we got here as a V, okay? That's it. And so now we should be able to see that how we can retrieve that value. So let's scroll up and let's see, go to example seven and then go build. And then we'll do, just run this because we've been doing time all before and we know thing. And notice that all of our, both, all three of our contexts got the same value. So it's a nice way of distributing um, values to across boundaries and processes. If you read the documentation, it's going to tell you, do not use the value context to pass in like optional parameter to a function or anything like that. That's the bad use of, that's not the intended use. People are going to be confused because nobody else is going to expect that. So do not use it in a way that doesn't, um, is not intended to be used. Okay. So you have ways of passing optional values, um, by using variadic func parameter. So use that if your function needs optional parameters. Do not use context value. I told you this was gonna be a long video. Um, aren't you glad that I speed up some of the coding? With that said, I hope that um, you sort of get to play with this, read the documentation, look at the examples as in Git um, repo. And, and in the next part two, we'll start looking at gRPC and we'll pick up exactly where we left off with proto buffers. So if you didn't look at the proto buffer stuff in the previous section, section 22 with um, binary encoding, definitely look at that um, and get up to speed in the last part of that where we use proto buff for encoding because we're going to use the proto buff file to define our gRPC services. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, hit the subscribe button, spread the word, appreciate it. Thank you very much. I still have to find time to upload my Udemy video to this channel. I intend to. I've just been really busy. That's why this video is even late. So, all right. Take care. See you in the next video.